I would be the same way. But listen, God's going to meet with us today. I've talked to him this morning. He said he's going to bless his word this morning. He's going to encourage your heart. So what I want you to do is I want you to focus like a laser beam on the word of God. Hey, it is an incorruptible seed, right? Yeah. It is life-giving. It will help us to bear fruit if we pay attention and we take heed to it. So I want your attention this morning. I want you to get your spirits involved with the message this morning. And I'd like you to turn to the Gospel of Mark, please. The Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. In my adult Sunday school class, I've been teaching you the Gospel of Mark verse by verse. I haven't gotten to this section yet, so you're getting something to go before my class gets. So, Mark chapter 9. And I want to draw your attention to verse 14. Let's read. Mark chapter 9 and verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. That doesn't mean they saluted him like an officer, they, they greeted him. And he asked the scribes, why question you with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, who has a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth them, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him and saith, O oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, Listen to what Jesus said to him. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believe. Do you believe that? Church, do you believe what Jesus said? If you can believe, all things are possible to him that believe. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. When Jesus saw the people come running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou deaf, dumb, and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him, and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could we not cast him out? And he said unto him, This kind cometh forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. I want to preach a message this morning entitled, Power Failure. Power failure. The reason why the disciples could not cast out the demon was because of power failure. Now, there's a leader of a great denomination, it's a false denomination, who once said to one of his men, they had a very opulent building, they had many members and silver and gold everywhere and money in the treasuries, and he said, behold, the church can no longer say, silver and gold have I none. At which the old man said to him, True, but neither can we say what follows that. But such as I have, I give unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That older man had grasped the truth that many people today never grasp. Let me tell you this morning, I believe it was the Lord this morning as we were in the room here praying and we were discussing some things and some things were brought to my attention. Listen, the real measure... The real success of a ministry or a church is not how fine its building is. And let me say this. The measure and success of a ministry is not how big it is, number-wise. Also, the measure and success of a church is not measured by how much money it has or how great the crowds are. The real measure, folks, of a successful ministry or a successful church Listen, is whether or not it operates in the power of God. You can have all of those things, and the power of God is not evident. And folks, it's the power of God, it's the power of God that brings us to salvation. It's the power of God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the believer's life, 
that delivers him from the power of sin. And one day, by God's grace, will take us to heaven. It's the power of God. Listen, we're living in a day of ministerial success where people say successes. Every church wants to be the largest. Every church wants to be the richest. Every church wants to be the most influential. Every church wants to be the most considered successful church in the community. The sad truth is this. This is the sad truth of that statement that I just made. God has a very different standard for determining what constitutes a successful ministry. God has a totally different idea. In this passage this morning that we look at, the Lord teaches us. He's going to teach us the most important, important ingredient in a successful ministry. The disciples lacked that ingredient. They didn't have it, and as a result, what did they do? They failed miserably. Without the power of God, they fell flat on their face. And so is every ministry, and so is every church that doesn't operate in the power of God. Oh, yes, they may have crowds, they may have money, they may have a great building, but in the eyes of the Lord, they're dead. Listen, we're told in verse 18, look at me. The last four words. And they could not. They could not. They attempted to cast out the demon from a little boy. And the Father's words sum up what happens today behind many pulpits today in many churches. They leave with a thought, and they could not. That man was right. That man was right. He came to those men hoping to find some help for his family. And they could not. They could not. My question this morning is, and I've already given you the answer, but why, why did they fail? They failed because they lacked spiritual power. Now folks, if we can ever get to the point where we have spiritual power, not only as individuals, but in the church people as a whole, we will see revival. We will see a movement of God that we could never even dream or think could possibly happen. Now, if you have that thought in your mind this morning, you can look around and say, boy, it's not that many folks here this morning. Listen, Jesus had 12 people. One of them was a devil, Judas Iscariot. And if you look at their history, they wouldn't have been the people that we would have chosen. <coughs> you have more than 11 people here this morning. And those folks reached the gospel and took it to the world. I'd like to us to look at these verses today because we need the message that it teaches. We're trying to carry out the Lord's business, the Lord's ministry in these dark, sinful days. Listen, we live in a day and age where not only is sin tolerated, but it's encouraged. And where our Supreme Court makes outlandish decisions that are totally contrary to the Word of God. Listen, folks, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. And if the salt loses its savor, wherewith is it good? It's good to be tried on the foot of men, right? Too many times we walk away from our churches and we say, and they could not. Our problem is the same that the Lord's disciples had that day. Often we lack the necessary ingredient for spiritual success. Oh, it's available to us, but we lack it. Listen, by God's help, I want to take these verses, I want to just open up the Word of God to you morning, this morning, and I want to preach on that subject, power failure. And if you have a pencil and a piece of paper, I'll give you just a three-point outline. But it would be far better if God would take up an indelible pen and take this and etch them on the table of your heart. These are the three points I want to look at this morning. Number one, the lack of spiritual power. Number two, the Lord of spiritual power. And number three, the lessons of spiritual power. And folks, if, I beg you this morning, if I could just have your attention, this will revolutionize your life. This will revolutionize your church. If everyone gets involved in saying, what the Lord says I'll do, you're going to see great and mighty things. So let's listen carefully. Number one, let's look at the lack of spiritual power. Look at verse 14. But before we get there, you see the word and? It seems, Brother Tim, you started the passage right, right in the middle, and I need to know what, what, what the scene is. Well, here's what's taking place. In chapters, in 
chapter 9, verses 1 through 13, the Lord has taken Peter, James, and John, and he's taken them up to the Mount of Transfiguration, which most scholars believe is Mount Hermon. And while he's there, the Bible tells us that he's, he's trans, transformed. They, they see his glory. His face shines as the sun, and his garments become glistening. And for the first time, who he is on the inside breaks forth, and they're able to see his glory on that mountain. And we're told about how Peter wanted to be, build three tabernacles because Moses and Elijah appeared with him. And they heard the conversation that Moses and Elijah were talking about. It was about the soon coming death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they're there. And the interesting thing is a cloud comes and it says it overshadowed them. And out of the cloud came, came the Heavenly Father's voice and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. So they, this comes on the heels of that. These men had seen the Son of God in His glory, in His brightness. And they must have been filled with excitement as they're coming down that mountain. We saw the Lord in His glory. And we, we heard things. We saw Moses and Elijah. Could you imagine that? Ah, oh, the excitement of that. They're coming down that mountain. And it's a long walk. And the excitement and the, and the discussion that must have flowed from that. Do you think He's going to set up the kingdom soon? They believe that. That might have been part of the discussion. But when they arrive back in the valley, you see, when there's a mountaintop, there's always a valley, folks. When they get down into that valley, what they find out is they become face to face with a world that's struggling under demonic force. Now, I want to tell you this morning that the Christian life is full of hills and it's full of valleys. That's just the way it is. And one day, a disciple can be up on the mountain with the Lord experiencing the glory of God, the glories of heaven, sweet communion with the Father, and the next be battling the forces of hell in the same day. And it also makes me forget, not forget that since the Lord is up in heaven, and He is in His glory right now, that He doesn't forget the concerns of His church on planet Earth. Listen, the Lord is concerned about you as an individual, what you're going through, and he's also concerned about this church. He cares about it. He is the one who started the church. We find out that he purchased the church with his own blood. It's very precious to him. So they come down from the mountain. And let me just say this. When you're on the mountain, folks, when things are going well, suck it up. Suck it up. Enjoy it. Revel in it, because you're going to need that experience to help you get through the battles. So if things are on a mountaintop right now, relish it. Bask it, bathe in it, because when the valley comes, the glory will get you through. Yes. So he gets to the mountain, and look what it says. And the scribes are questioning with them. That word question has the idea of disputing or arguing. Uh, evidently, the disciples have tried to cast out the demons and probably have called upon the name of Jesus to get rid of the demons. Now, the scribes and Pharisees were no friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. When they hear this going on, I'm sure they're mocking. What is your, are you, you have no power? Is your Lord lacking? Uh, is his power fading? And they're questioning and they're disputing with that. They don't know what to say. I mean, listen, don't forget, these guys have already cast out demons before and have done miracles, but this time, it's not working. So he goes down there. This man has brought this demon-possessed boy. I believe we'll find out that he intended to bring him to Jesus, but Jesus is up on the mountain. So he brings him to his followers, his disciples, and they can't cast out the demon. Well, listen to this, look at verse 15. And straightway all the people, okay, Jesus is coming down the mountain. When they beheld him, Jesus, they were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. Now hang on a second. You ever read your Bible, and, and you're not really paying attention to what it says? I, I've done it. Look what it says there. Jesus hasn't done a miracle. He hasn't preached. He hasn't healed anybody. But as he's coming down the mountain, and the people seem they're greatly amazed. What greatly amazed them? Did you, does that beg the question? What greatly amazed them? I can't be dogmatic about this, but I have a sneaking suspicion. I believe when he came down that mountain, number one, he had energy. He was enthusiastic. He just came down from this huge mountain, number one. But number two, I believe that the radiance that he exhibited on the Mount of Transfiguration 
hadn't totally faded away from him yet. There was still some glory maybe left on his face or his clothes still glistening. Why do you think that? Hey, you remember what happened to Moses? When Moses went up on the mountain and he saw the glory of the Lord, that it shone so bright down his face, that in order to be with the children of Israel, he had to put a veil over his face. That's what greatly amazed them, folks, I believe. And it says they came running to him. We're going to find out these people must have been on the track team because they run two times to Jesus. So he comes on the scene. And look at verse 16. He asked the scribes. Now, you read the other accounts and he addresses the crowd, it says. But Mark has the idea that he's really questioning the scribes. And his question is, what question with them? Here's the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's seeking information, although he knows everything. In his humanity, he humbled himself and became a man so that he could experience what we experience. So he questions them, and he says, what are you asking him about? The Father begins in agonizing detail to describe to him that pitiful condition of his son. Now just picture this is your boy. The Bible tells us as a child, he's had this demon possession. And we find out in verse 17 that he says, I have brought my son unto thee. You see, he actually brought him to Jesus, but Jesus wasn't there, but now he is. He said, I brought unto thee my son, which has a dumb spirit. He can't speak. In verse 25, when Jesus rebukes the demon, he says, thou dumb and deaf spirit. So he's also deaf. Now, when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration and that cloud overshadows him, the Heavenly Father says, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We find out in Luke, when the man with the demon possessed son comes, he says, this is my only son. Isn't it amazing that on the mountain you have Jesus saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There's the beloved Son. And then when you get down to the valley, there is the bedeviled Son. His only Son. And every verb here, as he describes what's going on with his son, is in the present tense. Listen to what it says here, and 18. And whithersoever, wherever, at home, abroad, in public, he taketh him. That word taketh means to seize and to take as one's own possession, to do with as one wants. He has full control of it, and he's foaming. He's foaming at the mouth. He's gnashing, grinding with his teeth. And he's pining away, he's wasting away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. Verse 19. He answered him and said, Oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. You know, I want you to circle that word, oh. You should look at the O's of Scripture. That word O is a word of deep anguish. Have you ever gotten on your knees before the Lord and you cry what? Oh, God, help me. Oh, I need help, Father. It's a cry of deep anguish. Jesus is deeply hurt here. It's usually reserved for a time when someone's burdened in prayer. People would often come before God and cry out their heart's petitions and lead it with, oh, it's deep. Have you ever been there? So sad, so perplexed by your problems, no answer in sight. Have you ever had a time when your heart was breaking and your soul vents its pain out to the Lord by saying, oh, Lord. And maybe it's the only words you can utter because you're so broken. What Jesus is doing here, and I want you to catch this, what Jesus is doing here, he's, he's expressing his displeasure toward everybody who's, who's assembled there at that event. He is hurt that no one seems to believe in him. I want you to know unbelief causes grief to the heart of God. Why would that be? Listen, he's displeased because without faith, it is impossible to please him. Where there's no faith, you can't please the Lord. He's distressed. The disciples who had seen his power firsthand, remember? He had raised people from the dead. Fit, fed 5,000. Uh, uh, 5, 
He had walked on the water. He had calmed storms. Yet they still don't totally trust him. The religious leaders, obviously, they don't have faith. The crowd that's gathered there, they lack faith. And even this broken-hearted father, who we're going to see in a few moments, doesn't have the faith to be able to see his son healed. And Jesus cries out in the depths of his spirit, how much longer am I going to have to put up with you? That's a heartbreaking moment, folks. Following the fact that he had just received great glory on the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, and his father had said, I'm well pleased in you. To have to come down and deal with a bunch of people who were faithless, despite the fact that the Son of God had proven to them time and time again, not only his power, but his faithfulness. I believe at this point in time, he's ready to go back to his father's house. It's just a sad, sad moment. But you know what the saddest aspect of this is? It's, it's not the condition of the boy. That's not the saddest part. It's not the spirit of the scribes. It's not the anguish of the father. The saddest aspect of this story is that his disciples lack faith. Their absolute powerlessness. Jesus knew what was going to happen. He went on to the mountain. Right? He knew what was going to take place. Think about it. Think about it. They seen him do amazing miracles. Amazing things he had done. Yet they still lack genuine faith. Just turn back a little bit in your Bibles, if you will, to Mark chapter 6. And look at verse 7. And he called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over what? Unclean spirits. Look at verse 12 and 13. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. Not only had they seen Jesus perform miracles, but they had performed miracles themselves. But now it is said of them, and they could not. In many ways, these nine disciples were at the bottom of the hill that day are like a picture of the modern church. And when I say modern church, I'm talking as a church in, uh, in general, and I'm talking about churches in particular. Like them, churches have the reputation. These guys have reputation, they have power. Like them, churches have a reputation that they have power. This father came to Jesus, but he thought that his disciples could help, so he goes to them, and they couldn't help. They had a reputation, that they could help. But when he got there, there's no power. Listen, most churches have a nice facility, especially in America, to meet. Most churches, most churches have gifted people behind the pulpit who can preach and teach the Word of God. Most churches today have all that they need as far as meetings, as far as people in the pews, money to be able to finance the work. But most churches lack what they need most. And that is the power of Almighty God. So when you look around today, don't look for people. Don't look for money. Don't look for a better building. Look for the power of God. That's what you need. That's what I need. This building here that's put on this road has a sign outside. It says Broad Street. Baptist Church. That sign is making a promise to the world as they pass by in their cars, as they pass by uh, on foot, that everybody who passes by the sign tells them that these people in this building this morning are meeting with God. This church promises a needy world that they can find help if they would come here, right? This church says, hey, if you need God, we can help you get to him. This church says, if your life is broken, hey, we can take you to the one who can fix it. Listen, this church says by its existence here, if your family is broken and falling apart, Jesus can put it back together again. If you're lost, we can show you how to get to heaven, how to be saved. Now, this church makes a promise to the world that we're different than they are. We're the same, but we're different. Let's think about what it means, as we assemble here this morning, we represent the cross. 
We represent the blood of Jesus Christ. We represent the power of God to save souls. Uh, we represent a place where a person can secure their eternity in heaven, right? We represent the Christ who died on the cross, was raised from the dead, and sits at the right hand of God the Father. We represent the power of God in our own lives that God's freed us from the bondage of sin. But even more than that, we represent people who are separated unto the Lord and were separated from sin. We want to live holy lives. We're different. We're committed to the preaching and the teaching of God's Word. We're committed to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. But how about the word church? Church comes from a Greek word that means a called out assembly. That tells the word that we've been called out from among them to be different. The church is not a social club. The church is not a place where you to be entertained, although entertaining things may happen. We're a church. We're a church. Listen, we're a church. We're a called out assembly. God is the one who instituted the church. His power should be in us. His power should be on us. His truth should be within us. We should be walking the way he wants us to work, walk. We should walk according to his word. But listen, most churches today lack spiritual power. The world comes in. And I'm not just talking about this church. I'm talking churches all over the place. People come in. There's no touch of God. There's a program. There's a bulletin. People come here to work out, but there's no power. There's no help. What does the world do? What does the world do? It does exactly what the scribes did. They begin to mock. Listen, may it never be said of me, may it never be said of you as an individual, may it never be said of this church or the church that I attend that they could not. I'm here to challenge you this morning to take it up a notch. To take it up a notch. Listen, he's the Lord of spiritual power. Jesus hears about the boy's condition. And he commands the boy to be brought to him. So the boy is off in a distance right now, but he commands that the boy be brought to him. Look at verse 19. He answered and said, how long, okay? But at the end he says, bring him unto me. So he's not with Jesus right now. He brings the child to him. And what happens? When they begin to bring that demon-possessed child to the Lord, look at verse 20, they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, threw him to the ground. Boom! And what else did he do? He fell on the ground, and he wallowed foaming. He begins to tumble on the ground. See, because... The demons are the only ones that have faith that Jesus is going to kick them out of that bowl. That demon inside knows that Jesus has the power to tell him to get out. And he begins to freak out and to fight it. It's amazing. Look at verse 21. While this is going on, now picture in your mind. Get into it. He's there. He's rolling on the ground. He's falling on the ground. And you would think Jesus would say, hey, get out of here. Jesus starts having a conversation with the Father. Listen to what he says. He asked the Father, how long is it since this came on then? Jesus is acting like a doctor. You give him the symptoms, okay, how, how long has your child had these things? He's not freaking out. He's not getting excited. He's not shaking. Because he, he's God. He's got he's complete control of the situation. He says, how long has it been this way instead of a child? Since he was a child, this has been going on. And what, what happens? He describes to him how it happened. And oftentimes, it's cast in. I want you to, words are important to me. I tell you this all the time. This is no accident that he falls into the fire. This demon is making this child suicidal. You want to know the increase in teenage suicide? Listen to me. In John 8, 44, the Lord Jesus Christ says that Satan is a murderer and a liar. That's not just his title. That's his job description. He's a murderer and a liar. So he comes to Jesus and he tells him he's been this way since he's been little. He's attacked the boy repeatedly and, and, and tried to throw him in the fire. So I picture this guy's got scars. He's got burns. 
tried to throw him in the water, tried to destroy him. Pitiful sight. Now it's interesting. Look at verse 22 again. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Wow. Why do you think he brought his original attempt was to bring him to Jesus in the first place, right? Question class, if you've been paying attention, why do you think he wanted to bring his son to Jesus? Somebody tell me. To cure. He believes Jesus initially can cure. But when he sees the lack of power in the children of God, he begins to doubt. He said, if you can. Now, it's like he brought because he thought he could, but now he's not too sure because, listen, the people of God, when they don't show forth the power of God in their own lives, the world doesn't believe that Jesus has any power. And he said, if you can, do anything. Have compassion on us. Listen, when a family is having problems, not just the demon-possessed kid is, is suffering, but the family suffers. He said, have compassion on us. I don't know if you remember the Syrophoenician woman. Her daughter was also in, uh, had, had a demon, and she says, help me. She's coming for help for her daughter, but she's saying, help me. The other reason is that parents are, a good parent is so involved in their child's life that if they're hurting, you're hurting. So he says, have compassion on us. If you can do anything, it's a pitiful plea, but it's also a faithless plea. Now, this guy believes that the disciples can help. When they fail, his faith in Jesus is also shattered. You get that? Look at verse 17. This father had brought his son to the Lord. Master, I brought unto thee my son believing that he can help him. Now he says, can you do anything? Interesting thought here. Again, I'll tell you, I love words. When he first asked the Lord in verse 17, he talks about helping him. The word help there, the first time it's used, talks, I need your immediate help. I need it now. It's an error's tense. I need it now. When he says, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, that word help there, it means I need you to help me now, I need you to help me always. It's continuous present. Verse 23 is where the other word is used. Now listen. You know that in the original Greek, there was no before, punctuation. So this is interesting, and I thought about this. Look at verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, comma, all things are possible in that believe it. But how about this? What if you took the comma and you put it after the word canst? Is she saying, If thou canst, if I can? If you follow me? There's a different emphasis. You just move that, you move that punctuation mark just one little word over. If I can, you're questioning if I can? He's rebuking him for his doubt. And now he commands him to place his faith in him for his own child's healing. It's in your hands. Wow, what a responsibility. When a father hears that, he makes one of the most uh, honest and one of the most transparent prayers I've ever seen in the Bible. Here's what he says. He says, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. He said, Lord, I do believe in you. And I do believe in your power, but my faith is weak. Hey, anybody ever been there? Lord, I know your word's true, and you said you're going to meet all my needs according to your riches and glory. I believe that, but I don't believe it. What we need to do, folks, in those times where we believe but we don't believe, we need to do what this man said. He said, man, help me. Lord, give me grace to believe you more. Help me to trust your word. Help me to rely upon it. Listen, when you begin doubting, listen. That never accomplishes anything. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You don't get that thing settled, you're going to be, yeah, the Lord's going to take care of me. And as soon as he does it for a while, I say, I don't know if he's done. And you become unstable in all your ways. And what does Jesus do? He said, all things are possible to those that believe. Two times he used the word believe. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. 
Now look at verse. Look at verse where he says, "Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief." He believes anything is possible with the Lord, but he doesn't believe all things are possible. There's a big difference. He believes the Lord. If you can help me, if you can do anything, look at verse 22. If you can do anything, the Lord responds, all things. Not can I, I cannot can just do anything. I can do all things if you believe. So then Jesus, what he does is he, he tells, well, let's go to verse 25. Apparently what Jesus had done, what he had done many times before, uh, he takes people away from the crowd to get maybe to not embarrassed. He's private. He's not a show super. He doesn't really want a to kind of show. So in verse 25, it says, when Jesus saw the people come running together the second time, they're away. They see the demon tearing this boy. They hear the father crying out. Verse 24 says, straight the father of the child cried out and said with tears. I mean, he's broken. He's like, Lord, if this depends upon my faith to get my boy healed, he's broken. I, I gotta have faith then. I can't, I can't bear seeing him like this. And he's crying like any of us would with tears for his boy. Lord, please help me. I, I, want, I want to have that faith that I need. Listen, don't you cry to the Lord. Say, Lord, I need that faith. Cry out to him. Listen, the Lord responds to him when he cries out with an honest heart before him and cries out, Lord, I believe, but I need help. Then Jesus commands the Spirit to leave him. And what's interesting? In verse 25, he rebukes him. It's not a rebuke like that you would get to a safe person because demons are incorrigible. They can't repent. But what happens is, he calls him a foul spirit, and at the end of verse, he not only tells him to come out of him, but enter no more into him. It seems to me that the demon had access to come and go as he pleased. But now Jesus said, not only are you not going to, I'm going to cast you out of him, you're not going to come back ever again. And he says, I charge you, and the eye is in the emphatic, which means that I'm the Son of God. And what I say goes. I'm in charge. And that word command is a military term. It has the idea of military people uh, uh, being ordered in their ranks. He said, listen, I'm, I'm the commander. You're going to do what I tell you to do, and you're not going to enter in anymore. Hey, thank God that when I got saved, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Listen, I can't be possessed by a devil. The devil can't take away my salvation. The devil's on a leash. He can only do what the Lord allows him to do. I'm God's child, and I'm in God's protective hand. Praise God. Now, let me share some lessons with you. We saw the lack of spiritual power. We saw the Lord of spiritual power. But what's the lessons for us this morning? Here's the lesson. Listen up, church. Here's the lesson. A powerless church portrays Jesus Christ in a bad light. Because the disciples lacked power. They didn't have the power. The Father assumes that Jesus lacked power too. The same is true in the house of God. When a lost world walks into a church building and they don't sense the love of God, when they see that it's dead and lifeless, it's cold, it's apathetic towards the preaching of the Word of God, the lost assume we're just as lifeless. We're just as dead. We aren't we the sons of God? Behold what manner of man of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. So the only representation of Jesus that they can see physically is us. So if they see no power in us, they see no power in Jesus. They claim to have, we claim to have something that we can offer to the world to give to them. But sometimes we have nothing but cold, dead religion that helps no one. It's time that we gave an authentic representation about Jesus Christ and who He is, about the truth of who He is. He changes lives. Listen, none of you know me other than being here. But if I was to go back home and was to meet with the people that I went to school with, the people that I worked with back in New York, and they saw my life now, they would not recognize me. I'm different. I'm changed. 
I'm real. I have a lot of faults and failures. But listen, if you were to ask my family, does he live for God? I have no doubt that they would say yes. Authentic before my family. We should never be guilty of false advertising. We need to live up to what's written on our signs. So a powerless church portrays Jesus Christ in a bad, bad light. But here's something that's good. Weak faith is better than no faith at all. Weak faith is better. This father, he's filled with doubt. He believes, but he doesn't fully believe. He has a kernel of faith. Now, do you remember what Jesus said? In Matthew 17, 20, he said, because of your unbelief, you couldn't do many, many works there. But listen, he said, but verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. Why does it only take a mustard seed faith? Well, because even though a mustard seed is small, it's alive. It has the ability to produce. You may have weak faith right now, but you have a dynamic that wants to grow where you can be used greatly and move mountains. Listen, do you think Jesus is just like a used car salesman who promises you something that he can't deliver? I don't think so. I think when he says that we can move mountains if we have faith, we can move mountains if we have faith. I believe that. So listen, he's filled with doubt, but he gets what he desired from the Lord as his faith begins to increase as the Lord takes him along this process. God isn't put off by your doubts. He's going to try to encourage you in it. We need to remember that it isn't large faith. It's simply genuine faith. It's not the size of it. You could have great faith, but it's not real. It's not genuine. But I want to let you know something else. Jesus is still in the lifting up business. He still does that. Look what Jesus does. Look at verse 26. The Spirit cried and rent him sore. Now, that Spirit is given one last struggle, trying to stay in, to find the Lord as much as he can. He stays with him as long as he can, and then he casts him on the ground. And the convulsion was so great that the, the boy is exhausted. He seems like he's dead. Now, the interesting thing about this is the English language doesn't capture it, but this process went on for a while. This boy was convulsing for a while. And Jesus is just watching, just waiting. And what does he do? But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up. Hallelujah. He lifted him up. And he arose. When he's come to the house, the disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? He can lift a cold, apathetic heart of an individual. He can lift a cold, apathetic church as he did in the book of Revelation when they got back their first love. He can give you peace that passes understanding. When this episode is over, you come around third base, get ready to slide him down. When he gets his disciples alone, they ask him a question. Why didn't we have the power to be able to Accomplish what we want. Verse 28. Why could not we cast him out? I'll give them an A plus for being concerned about their spiritual failure. Hey, let me ask you a question this morning. Are you concerned about your spiritual failure? Or are you just going to go on and just live the way the way you are now? I, I don't know any of you, but I'm sure there's at least one, maybe, who is living in spiritual failure who may not care about it. But I hope, because you're here this morning, that you do care. He gives them a simple answer. And listen, here's the answer. They failed because of the lack of spiritual discipline in their life. Look at verse 29. And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but prayer and fasting. This was a high-ranking uh, demon that had possession of this child and would not let him go. He said, This isn't your normal kind. You're going to need power, extra power for this. They didn't fail because they didn't believe. They're trying to cast them out. They believe that they have the power. So what's the problem? They believe they can, they believe they can cast out the demon when they fail. What happened? They're humiliated. The problem was they believed in the wrong thing. The problem was that when Jesus was up on the mountain, they're trying to do it just like they always do, by ritual and by rote. We say these words, 
In Jesus' name be gone, they'll be gone. Just like the people in the book of Acts, when they tried to get rid of the demons, they couldn't do it because they had no power. Listen, let's stop looking back to the glory days of how things used to be and rest on and not rest on what the church did in the past. We have the power of God. We think we can have it because we pray a five-minute prayer, oh Lord, give me your power. No revival is going to come until God's people get serious about prayer. Hey, listen to this. Listen to this. Jesus said, this kind cometh, doesn't come forth but by prayer and fasting, right? So what are they supposed to do? Stop and pray and fast? No time for that. That's not what Jesus is saying. This is what he's saying, folks. Unless you have a prayer life, which means you have communion with God on a daily basis, unless you have, listen, you don't know what's going to happen without those doors. Something happens. What, you got to pray and fast now? It's too late. He's saying you don't know when these impossible situations are going to come up in your life. And if you're not connected to God by prayer and fasting, which means discipline, means submission to God. In the book of 1 Peter, it talks about resist Satan and he shall flee, right? But the verse before it says, submit yourselves therefore unto God. If we don't submit ourselves to the Lord, as per Romans 12, 1 and 2, present our bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service, we're done. You and I are no match for Satan. We can't fight him in our own way. They're trying to do it in their own strength. And they come back and they ask the Lord, why couldn't we do it? He said, your relationship hasn't been one of our made. You haven't been praying. You haven't been doing the disciplines. You haven't been going to church. You haven't been reading your Bible. You haven't been teaching your children by the wayside as you walk by the way and giving them instruction. You haven't been doing what you should be doing. And when you come to that impossible situation, folks, you're not going to have power. If you want to see revival, if you want to see church grow, I mean, you really want to see it grow. Now, if I was to ask you, if you really want to see the church grow, I know every one of your hands would go up. But if I said this, how many of you want this church to grow and are willing to pay the price and I'm going to tell you what it is and you'll make a commitment to God today to do it? How many of you raise their hand? It's not going to be easy. Hell does not give up its occupants easy. The strong man is binding people out there. Unless we have one who's stronger than the strong man, we'll never set people free. We need to pray. We're commanded to pray without ceasing. We must be surrendered. It's God's will to place everything we have in His possession. And we need to be totally dependent on the Lord for everything. Until we reach that place, the power of God will never fail. Ever pray, oh, let me have the power of His resurrection. We pray, man, look, I've got power. Hey, Jesus couldn't have the power of the resurrection first until He first died. You and I will never have the power of God in our lives until we die ourselves, our own will, our own plans, our own ambitions. We don't need new programs. We don't need more powerful personalities. We don't need new buildings. We don't need any of this. We don't need to be seeker friendly. What we need is to be available. Listen, I'll close with this. They didn't know what the problem would be that day when they got up. They're faced with an insurmountable problem. But that's the point. We never know when these problems are going to come up. So we have to have a life of prayer and fasting. Because when the demonized boy is before you or for me, and we don't have the power, we're not going to be able to help you. When the devil decides to attack your boy, and he will, and he is, and he will continue, you're not going to have the power for your own family to be able to pull him out of the places they need to be pulled out of. Hey, that's scary to me. My family needs a father who's tuned into God, who walks with God, who has a relationship with God, that at any moment when the attack comes, I'm already on spiritual ground and I'm ready to battle. Otherwise, your family will be taken out. And they could not. What a tragic statement. When people come here and you worship, what's their thought when they leave? Can they say, the power of God's in that place, they serve a mighty God, they serve a wonderful Lord, or do they leave saying, I went there for help, I went there for fellowship, I went there for hope, I went there for peace. I went there for acceptance. I went there for Jesus. And they couldn't show him to me. Has God spoken to you today? The next conversation you may have, God may open the door to witness to somebody. If you're not prayed up, it's separate from God. 
Has God spoken to you about your faith? Has He spoken to you this morning about your prayer life? Has He spoken to you about your level of surrender to the Lord? Has He spoken to you about how much you depend on Him? Listen, I don't speak to you. I can't get into the inner recesses of your heart. But if you're saved and the Holy Spirit has spoken to you this morning, will you listen to Him? Will you do what's necessary? If He's spoken to you about being saved this morning, He can handle that. If you need to be did, you need to come and be saved this morning. I've delivered a burden that's on my heart. The churches in America, for my own life, for your lives, for your church. We can either be a people who can, or we can be a people who could not. Which kind of people we are rests upon us. What will we do from what we heard today? Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you.